Hey, Jason Coates. Mark Brown. Bourbon Sane. DJ Beacon. Happy um, Robert Burns Night. Start off with a little bit of bagpipes as we're waiting for people to join us. Got my plate of haggis with some uh, potatoes O'Brien. Jason C., how you doing? Mash and Drum, how you doing? Hoyt Hempfeld, how you doing? Amy, how you doing? Thank you, Mo's Chun, thank you very much for tuning in. Alrighty, so that is uh, Scotland the Brave, probably the most well-known uh, Scottish uh, bag type bag pipe tunes. Uh, my fondest memory of listening to that was when I was uh, coming down from the Highlands on my way back to Glasgow and was just viewing uh, the splendor of, of the Highlands in Scotland, listening to that. So um, Jean-Paul van der Hoven, thank you very much for turning. He says, hi, Erica, I was going to go to bed, but this is better. Happy Burns Night. It is Friday night, so maybe you can sleep in uh, in the morning. Tamar, thank you very much for tuning in. Brad Murphy, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. So, a bunch of things to cover, but I've only got an hour. Uh, in an hour from now, Bill, the Whiskey Deck, will be going live. Um, so, thank you for joining me for dinner. Um, so, I'm going to uh, enjoy this. Grant's Premium. This isn't the ordinary canned haggis. It's Premium Haggis. So, I've had a canned haggis before. It was a Caledonian. I had haggis five times. I'm going to take a quick little bite before it gets cold. I had uh, haggis five times while I was in Scotland. If I hadn't had haggis in Scotland, I wouldn't bother with canned. Because I wouldn't have a basis of comparison. So when I uh, first met up with Roy and Aqu uh, Aquavite in uh, Glasgow, we went up to breakfast, sort of a late breakfast. The components here are basically sort of like a Scottish breakfast. Um, so I got the haggis, um, potatoes, and then I have um, tomatoes. Oh, there's one element I'm missing. I'm missing toast. I don't... Hey, Roy, thank you very much for tuning in. What do you know? <laughs> Aquavite is in the house. I'm missing toast. And so why do you have toast? Well, haggis is very heavy, very spicy. Potatoes, very heavy, very starchy. So you have tomatoes uh, for the acidity. You need something to light that up, lighten that up a little bit. So you need some acidity. Um, and so I have some tomatoes. These are stewed tomatoes. And I, I forgot, I was going to make toast as well. You want toast because it's going to give you some crunch, right? So a different texture. So heavy, heavy spice, um, some acidity, and then some crunch from toast. I forgot the toast, but I got plenty of food here, so we're, we're good. Um, anyway, so I first had haggis. So Roy and I had actually started eating. If I recall correctly, I was really, really tired. So my memory is not that great. And there are a bunch of different components on the plate. And I think I started eating haggis. And then he told me what it was. And I was like, what's the big whip? I didn't mind it. I liked it. I had haggis at uh, the school. The best haggis I had was actually at the um, Scotch Whiskey Experience when I was doing the class, taking the class there. That was the best. Um, I had sort of haggis hush puppies uh, up at the Doorknock Hotel. Had haggis. Oh, I had haggis at the restaurant at uh, the cafe at Ardbeg. The best I had was there uh, at the cafe, uh, the Scotch Whiskey Experience. Anyhow, so um, I'll put a link to Roy's video at the end of this. So um, Robbie Burns Night was on a Thursday last year. It's on a Friday this year, which lined up with Roy's uh, live show. So he had haggis that was more in a form of like a sausage. And he did a sort of a ceremonial cutting with a knife and he read a poem. So uh, I looked at the poem. I thought about trying to recite it, but um, I, I'm afraid I would screw it up. There is a tune we probably all know, but we didn't know it was Robbie Burns. Robbie Burns. And that is All Lang Syne. So uh, join in with me if you would. We're going to sing a little bit of Old Lang Syne. Should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? Should old acquaintance...
repentance be forgot and old lang syne. For oh, lang syne, my dear, for oh, lang syne, we'll take a cup of kindness yet for her whole so we sing this at New Year's all the time, and we all know it, but it's like the most well-known song that nobody knows anything about it. So that is uh, by uh, Robbie Brand. So I figured I would probably script re just reading a poem, but maybe I could do a, a job of singing it. By the way, so I'm having some whiskey with it. Um, so I, I did a can haggis. This is uh, premium haggis, uh, Grant's, I guess it's stewed tomatoes, potatoes O'Brien. Maybe that's a little too Irish. I don't know. But it's basically uh, potatoes. It's got peppers, a little salt and pepper. And then I made a, it's like a mustard and white sauce. And then I took a little bit of this whiskey, which I'll talk about in just a second, and put it into the sauce. And then, um, uh, and that kind of works really, really, really uh, well. I did this last year uh, as well, um, but I didn't keep that video. It was one on my old channel. So haggis is haggis, but there are different qualities of haggis. And supposedly you're not allowed to make haggis here in the United States because of one of the elements. Um, can one of you tell me here in the chat box, what is the element you're not allowed uh, supposedly to put in haggis and make it here in the United States? Tom R. says it's lungs. Um, I just bought some potatoes, O'Brien, for a future breakfast meal. No haggis, though. By the way, you, if you want to, you can get this sheep lungs. You can get this through Amazon. So I got this from Amazon. It's like 10 bucks or something. Anyway, so a lot of votes here for sheep's lung, and you're all wrong. It's actually Loch Ness Monster testicles. That's You, you, can't, you can't cook anything with Loch Ness Monster testicles. So... That's why you can't do haggis here in the United States. Anyway, you're right. It's lungs. Um, so if you hear a lot of pounding noise, someone's moving next stairs and they don't have an elevator. So they're taking a dolly down the stairs going boom, boom, boom. So that's what it sounds like drums kind of. Um, yes. So it, it's sheep lung. Not like not locked as monster balls. So the the worst haggis I had was actually at the Highlander Inn. I'm pretty sure they got that from a can. This is not as good as the Caledonian. I'll say that. So that if you look up on Amazon, you look up haggis um, on Amazon and you see an, it's like an orange can and it's called Caledonian. Um, it's kind of hard to tell you why it is better. This is all right. Um, I think the Caledonian is a little spicier and a little peppier. Um, this is sort of slightly granular, which Haggis is. It's very soft. It doesn't have as much pepper as the Caledonian, which I think I like a little bit more pepper. And it's a little bit, a little bit more bland um, than the Caledonian. The best, again, the best Haggis I had was at the Scotch Whiskey Experience in, in Edinburgh. Um, and they put... So you get haggis like this, and then they put like a thin layer of uh, potatoes on top of like that, and then some sort of sauce that was absolutely awesome. And I had it with an iron brew. So the whiskey, which I'm drinking here, and I have another glass right here. I need to increase the size of the chat box. Give me a second. I got it so I can read it a little better. Da -da -da. So I can read everybody's comments. Sorry about that. Um, and so the, the whiskey I'm having is the, this was one of my top 10. This is the Balekin 12 year old burgundy cash matured, heavily peated. This is bottled at 57.5% alcohol by volume. And if you look, if you can see the color on that, or I'm not, I'm still holding the bottle, I can just do this. It's got that red tint to it. So definitely you can tell it's got that wine cask influence to it. This was one of my top 10. In fact, I recall correctly, it was number three. I think this was number three, which the Scotch, uh, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society 
3.305 uh, sense of perfection. I think if I were to re-review it, I would probably put that one number three, put this one number four, but you know, whatever. Um, and as I'm having it now, because I just opened, I opened this while I was cooking. So um, since it's, it has, I mean, such high alcohol, it can take a, some water. It can take a lot of water and not lose any flavor. Mm. Nice. So I wanted to lower the temperature a little bit and make it as more like a beverage I'm having with a meal. It's actually slightly warm today. Um, so I put three ice cubes, ice cubes of milk. Man, it hasn't phased it at all. What I really like about this whiskey, it is very savory and sweet. Kind of like eating this haggis with um, the sauce. Got a lot of spice. It's very rich. Um, you get, get a lot of heavy wooden notes, but you get kind of like barbecue. You get some um, dried red fruit notes. Vanillas, spices, really, 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 uh, really, really nice. And I was a little toyed with what whiskey I wanted to do and what would work well uh, with this. Just as you want to have, the tomatoes are for acidity. You need some acid. when you're. If you watch cooking shows, they always talk about balance. And you, you want some acid. Line in, and I need the textural, I need, the one mistake I made, I forgot to do toast. Toast is to bring crunch, to give you a textural difference. So acidity helps um, lighten things a little bit, helps cut through the heaviness of everything else. Because this is pretty heavy, but uh, if you're going to go out and do a day of drinking whiskey, particularly with Roy hanging out in Edinburgh, we're going to go to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society and all the other places we drink some whiskey, uh, it, it helps to have a nice big breakfast. So one of the important things, I mean, and you guys know me, if you, you've been watching me for a while, I'm not just into whiskeys. I'm not just into wine. Everything about whiskey or wine, it's the people, it's the place, it's production. And in and all that is culture, history, music, um, geography, climate, and everything else. And some people, they just talk about, and that's fine. Some people just want to eat a good steak. They just want a good hamburger. They don't care what kind of cows they are, where the cows are from, what the cows were fed. They just want a good steak. And so that's fine. But I'm really into the whole thing. And I, when I went to Scotland, I fell in love with not just the whiskeys and the distilleries, but I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with... I loved interacting with the people. I liked, when I, on the long drive, I would tune on the radio just to hear the voice and just to get a sense of what goes on on the radio. What do they talk about in politics and music or sports? Of course, uh, there were a lot of uh, football or soccer games going on at the time. So, of course, that was why. And do they, you know, do they kind of yuck it up, you know, make a lot of jokes and goof around the way American um uh, DJs do. Yeah, in fact, it re some of that kind of reminded me of it. But I didn't really care what they were talking about. I just wanted to get a sense of what is the life of someone living in Scotland, traveling around, listening to the radio, what's that experience like? Um, having Iron Brew was another thing. Something that's real common over there. We don't know what it is over here. Just the everyday. Pick up a newspaper, if they still have newspapers. Um, read a magazine, watch television, regardless of whatever's on television, the news, it could be anything. Just to get a sense of the background of the day-to-day -day life of people who live in Scotland. Um, and everything about it. And then when I got back, there were things that I saw in Scotland, excuse me, I'm not supposed to talk with food in your mouth, but there are things on Scotland I didn't know what they were, wasn't familiar with them. So, hey, Kevin Miato, thank you very much for tuning in. Gregor, thank you very much for tuning in. Santa Cruz, and thank you very much for tuning in. I don't want to ignore you guys. I'm talking. Um, so, I did, like, there was these pick stones. Saw one right outside of Bob Blair. I didn't know what those were. So, I came back here, was watching documentaries. Um, and and I found myself, the more I started to read and, and, and watch videos, documentaries, whatever, about Scotland, the more I got homesick to go back. 
I'm going to try to keep from crying. But mm, my family lived in the same house from 1967 until 2014. And then we sold the house in 2015. So roughly 50 years. All my Christmases, all my Thanksgivings, all the birthdays, all family memories were in that house. Wherever I went, no matter where I was residing, where I was traveled to, home, home in here was the home I grew up in. Coming, it's where you can walk in the home, is where you can walk in the door and say, hey, what's for dinner? Uh, and go into the fridge and help yourself, and you're going to pet the dog, you pet the dog and pet the cat, give mom a hug, and all that. And all the memories are in there. Because so we, I didn't grow up a lot. I mean, didn't grow up in a lot of different places, same, same place. So when I sold the house in 2015, because my parents were gone, my oldest brother was gone, that's, it's hard to explain, that sense of a center of a home, a place of belonging, was gone. The house got sold, um, new owners bought it, they repainted, they redid the house, it didn't look, it doesn't even resemble, vaguely resemble the house I grew up in, which is, I'm actually glad they did that. But when I went to Scotland, so I've traveled a bit. Mark Brown says he'll go with me to Scotland and carry my camera gear. I need someone who's a good photographer and videographer and editor, not just someone to carry my gear. Um, I've been, I've been up to France. I like France. It was nice. I, I like visiting the chateaus and it was very unique and nice cultural experience. I've been all over the United States and it was all very nice and a lot of nice places to visit. I never, ever, ever, ever had an emotional connection with a place like I did in Scotland. And I can't even explain it. I can't even put words to it. I don't even know why. There was just something about it. Maybe it's a romance, but I just fell in love with Scotland. That's why I'm so excited. Gregory says, the USA is your home. Scotland is your home. <laughs> I'll have to look that up. I don't know what that means. So um, I'm in the middle. I've, I've already booked my flights to go back to Scotland in July. Um, Berman Stain, how you doing? I've booked my flights to go back to Scotland. I'm working out my itinerary. I've signed up for classes I'm going to take at the uh, Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. I'm already planning on 2020. I'm already making inquiries to do a one-week training thing at uh, the um, Springbank Distillery. Um, so I'm already thinking ahead to the next year because Springbank is that one-week training, hands-on training they have is already booked for 2019. But I'm really looking forward to getting back there. Um... Again, meeting up with people, again, meeting distilleries, seeing some places I hadn't been to before, but just kind of, I just want, I just want Scottish dirt under me, underneath my feet. I want to breathe Scottish air. Um, and if I could, I would, I would see if I can move there uh, and make it home because I just fell in love with it. So... Um, if, if you're screamish about trying to haggis and you think it's some big whoop deal, it's not, it's fine. It's not any different than eating an American hot dog or sausage. I think it's just the thought about it. When I first heard of haggis and I thought about eating, you know, what it would be like to eat it. I thought it would be like eating the entrails of a roadkill, <laughs> you know, um, that's what I kind of pictured in my head, you know. I wasn't thinking of anything like this. So, um, in case you guys are wondering about this, the Balekin, 12-year-old, uh, heavily painted burgundy cask, matured. This is from Vine and Table in um, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, and they do not ship. So, and if you're not familiar with Balekin, Balekin is a peated Edredor. So, Edredor Distillery. If they make a peated whiskey, they call it Balekin, and if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, so they don't ship. So 
I went online, went to their website. They had some still in stock, so I bought two of them. And Mark, um, Scotch Ford Dummies, uh, shipped them to me, so I was able to get them. So uh, Scotch Ford Dummies is having a dinner, a Deanston dinner, on February 22nd. I would like to go back there and would like to go. Unfortunately, due to my work schedule, I'm not going to be able to go. Um, so anyway, so if you go back to, excuse me, if you go to the Scotch for Dummies dinner, February 22nd, they're doing, it's multiple courses um, paired with um, Deanston whiskeys. You get the bottle to take home and then you get a souvenir uh, sort of bottle hanger uh, as well. If you're there, go to uh, Vine and Table in Indianapolis and ask them, do you have any store exclusive bottles? Because you're definitely going to want to bring something home. And if they still have this one, you're going to want to bring that one home. Oh, blood sausage. Jason Coates says, if you like blood sausage, I think haggis is child's play. Yeah, we, so uh, when Roy and I had breakfast, it's kind of a late breakfast. We had blood sausage on there, on there as well. Um, I'm trying to remember it. It wasn't as spicy as a uh, haggis. Uh, it was kind of oddly textured, I guess. But it, again, it wasn't that big of a deal. George Cobbins says, I may have to seek out the Balekin when I'm there. So if, yeah, so George, yeah, if you go there, or even this, I don't know how long they will hold it. Um, you might want to order it now before they're sold out. So see if they've got it, order it, and then see if they'll hold it. Tell them, look, you're coming out. You know, what, another month or whatever? And see if they'll hold it for him. Just tell them you'll, you'll come pick it up. Um, but I wouldn't wait. Mm. So, um, 6 o'clock, Bill Whis Whiskey Dictionary is coming on. Um, he and I are meeting up next weekend uh, in San Diego. Uh, so Bill's on business in San Diego, and then I'm flying down there. Uh, we may go live Thursday night. I don't want to interfere with Scotch, Scotch Four Dummies, or we may just record something, and then I'll post it later. So um, February on my channel is Isla Month. I'll be doing some Core Range whiskeys, as well as some Fish Eel Edition whiskeys, and some other special uh, whiskeys. I'm going to be having guests uh, all during the month. I have, some of them are confirmed, some are tentative. Um, so February is just going to be an absolutely awesome month on my channel. Uh, really, really uh, looking forward to it. Going to be breaking in into some of these whiskeys that I brought back from uh, uh, Scotland. Um, Isla, if I had to choose one region and stick with that for the rest of my life, it would be Isla. Would I want to live there? Maybe not in the winter. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you might run out of things to do in the winter. Mm. Hoyt says, white sausage is great too. Don't, just don't ask what's in it. Uh, that sounds a bit uh, euphemistic. I don't know about that one. And Kenneth Kelty says, he's not into organ meats. Tried with no success. Here's the thing, when I was in the Marine Corps, you eat some really bad food. MREs, this dried food that they, you know, it's dried, dehydrated, and compacted. Uh, we said it was, we, MREs, we said MREs, it's supposed to be meals ready to eat. We said it was meals rejected by Ethiopians. Because um, it, it's no bueno. I would rather, in a heartbeat, rather eat this than anything I've ever ate out of an MRE. Hmm. So, getting a little bit more familiar with Robbie Burns, Robert Burns, to get a little bit, because, see, Robert Burns is someone, I imagine Scottish children hear about all their life, right? They hear about in school. They have their traditions. Meanwhile, here in the United States, we hear about George Washington and um, Henry David Thoreau or uh, Mark Twain, you know. We don't hear about Robert Burns. So if you want to really get, and what's behind 
the whiskey, you want to get a little bit, just, I mean, I mean, you could spend your entire life studying Scotland, right? Um, but at least a little bit, get into it. Read a book about them. Read a wiki page, a Wikipedia page about them. Or um, uh, top whiskeys. Top whiskeys. Um, excuse me. I'm going to belch here. And I'm talking, so I'm sucking in air as I'm eating. So, that's why I'm burping. Top Whiskey did some little video clips on Robert Burns night. Like he did a really good, they're just short little things, you know. Um, so if you're not familiar with Top Whiskeys, I'm, I really, really like what they do. They're do. What they do is just radically different than what anybody else does. They're, it's, they're more about into storytelling about whiskeys. Eric Gilbert, thank you very much for tuning in. Storytelling, he's, they started doing this comical uh, whiskey news thing. Uh, which I really, 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 really like. It's, it's pretty, the nice short clips, you can watch them really, really fast. Um, and so if he's watching this later, hello. Um, so if you want to know at least just a little bit more about Robert Burns, check out the latest videos uh, by Top Whiskeys. I really, really, really like them. I'm sure there's documentary videos on YouTube you could watch, or at least read the Wikipedia page. So if you were to study Germany, you get to know, know Germany, Germany background and its culture and history. There are a couple of poets you'd want to get to know would be um, Schuller. Oh, now my brain just went blank on the other one. Goethe and Schiller. Well, well, two well-known German uh, poets. United States. I mean, there's, I, there's a ton of United States poets you'd want to get to know um, and writers. Uh, including, you know, uh, or uh, maybe Edgar Allan Poe. Um, uh, Goethe. Goethe and Schiller. Thank you very much. So, uh, Jan Paul Vanderhoven. Goethe and Schiller. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Believe it or not, in San Francisco, in, um, by the way, it's not spelled Goethe, is how you would say it in English. Goethe, if I'm, uh, uh, I said it right a minute ago. Goethe and Schiller. And Schiller, right. Um, there's actually a statue of them. It's a replica of the one that they have in, in uh, I, I think it's in Berlin. Uh, they have one in San Francisco, uh, right next to the uh, Academy uh, of Sciences. Anyway, I don't want to go on about Germany. So um, if you're going to go, if you're into Bao Blair, and you like Bao Blair's whiskeys, and you know there's little inscriptions, these funny little inscriptions on the bottles, then you want to watch documentaries on ancient history of Scotland. There's a couple of really good ones on YouTube um, in which they talk about the pick stones and these mounds. Now, the only reason I know about those is because we had just had a really, really good um, tour guide uh, going to Isla, the bus driver. He was an awesome, awesome, awesome. He didn't just drive us to the distilleries and say, okay, everybody get off here. They're going to this distillery. As you would go by historical uh, places, he would point things out. He had a microphone so everybody could hear him in the bus. Um, and he would talk about it. And this was a guy who was really passionate about whiskey. He wasn't just some guy who got a job to drive a bus to be a, to drive tourists around. He was really passionate about whiskey, passionate about the history. Uh, and it really came through. And so he, we made some stops. For example, one of the whiskeys that I'll be um, reviewing is this Kildalton. I'll be reviewing this uh, next month during Isla Month. And I'll show you the photos that I took at the Kildalton Chapel, which is about a 10 minute drive from um, Ardbeg. And so I'll review that whiskey and I'll share my photography and share a little bit of information about that. That's like a fourth century, it's a fourth century uh, chapel there. Um, so he would take, he took us to that place. Uh, and I think Roy has mentioned it as well. There's this little, I don't know if they call it a cafe. Someone sets up a table and there's like free goodies. And you go there and you, out of your own will, whatever you want to, you drop off some money and then you help yourself to one of the goodies. I don't know. I didn't, I wasn't eating anything. We'd already eaten breakfast, so I didn't eat anything. Um, it might be some sort of pastries or cookies or something. I don't know what they are because I didn't look. Um, but people just sort of freely drop something off and freely leave some money there and nobody, people don't steal it and stuff. Um, but one of the things I enjoyed about him, um, so if you're planning on a trip to Scotland, um, is, to, is Scottish taking Scottish, Scottish roots. Is they'll point the thing, those things out, 
if he if I had if I'd been driving on my own, I would not have seen these things. I would not have noticed these things, and, and I wouldn't have been become curious about them, and then wanted to read and watch documentaries about them. Uh, Gregor says, "Fun Isla fact: My father found the oldest found cross metal detecting oh metal detecting, and it's now in the Finlagen Visitor Center near Buda. That's really really cool. So he's out there with a metal detector, and he found a metal cross." And now it's at the Venice. That's really, really cool. Um, Amy says, you could retire in Scotland and be a tour guide. I would have to work on my accent because who wants to listen to an American in Scotland? Um, there were, I did have a couple of people, tour guides, who had a Scottish accent. But you could tell it was a little different. There was a lady, she was at Glen Forkless. And I'm listening to it and it just sounds a little different. Um, it turns out she was from Savoy, France, which is on the east side of France. Hey, whiskey friend, Alan, thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Um, and this Saturday, you guys won't see it until later, but Alan and I will be meeting up on Saturday. We'll be recording, uh, uh, doing a whiskey review and talk together, and then I'll download it, edit it, and then repost it during Isla month. So I'm uh, looking forward to talking to you on, uh, Saturday, Alan. Um... Anyway, uh, what was I saying? I lost track. Anyway, there's these mounds. You think it looks just looks like normal hill of dirt, but it turns out they're burial ancient, ancient, ancient burial mounds, and a lot of them are full of fish bones. But there's some human remains in there as well. Now they don't because there was no uh, written history. They didn't have like paper. We're talking thousands of years ago. Um, there's a lot of mystery as to what they're doing there. But I would just drive by that and think, drive and think it's just a big mound of dirt if he hadn't been pointing them out. Um, and then stirred, stirred up curiosity to me so that I could come home and watch a, a documentary. Hmm. Don't have fast whiskey. Thank you very much for tuning in. So I would say this haggis was similar to the one that I had at the Highlander Inn up in Speyside. Uh, Highlander Inn, if you're looking for hotels up there on the space side, they had a really nice whiskey bar. The food was... And the accommodations in the hotel were meh. I didn't particularly care for it. I will be staying at the Craig Alachie Hotel, which is actually right down the road from there on my next stop to space side. I'm hoping it's going to be a, 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 a lot nicer. Um, the main issue I had was showers weren't all that great. And it wasn't exactly quiet when you were trying to sleep. Um, and it was a little bit, it could use about, the whole place could use about $50,000 in upgrades. Uh, but the bar was unbelievable. Um, huge selection there. Bourbon says, how does the haggis change the whiskey for you? Excellent, excellent question, young lad. It doesn't really. This is a really big, bold Powerful, spicy whiskey. This is a big, dense, spicy, heavy um, food. So in food and wine pairing, you can either go contrast or con or things that are similar. If you go things that are too similar, sometimes it's like an overdose of spice or an overdose of whatever. So then you go opposite. So if you have East Indian food, curry, or Asian food, Chinese food, that's real spicy. You kind of counterbalance that with a little bit of sweetness to it, with an off dry Riesling or something like that. That can work really, really well. But sometimes, um, some things that are similar will go to well together, but you don't really know until you try. So these are two things that I would say are similar in profile in terms of spice, boldness, intensity of flavor, and all that. So they, they work more alike. So I would say this is something that the whiskey competes. It holds up. It doesn't get drowned out by all the spice. Um, particularly, these are stewed tomatoes, not regular tomatoes. Uh, they're Italian stewed tomatoes. Not something, not traditional Scottish, but whatever. Uh, and then they have a lot of pepper and garlic salt on the potatoes. So it's something that holds up its own. It doesn't, we don't want one to drown out the other, so you can't taste this. So if I want that with a, you know, a light sherried whiskey at 40 ABV. Um, maybe the whiskey wouldn't hold up as well. And 
The flavors of the food would overwhelm the whiskey, just as you would if you went with a light Chardonnay or something like that. So I chose this one because I got two bottles of this and I wanted to have some. Uh, but also I thought the big, bold, and powerful flavors would hold up really, really, really well uh, with the whiskey. And it did. It, it worked really, really, really well. Mm. I like this more when I had, I think this needs more, this, I mean, this is a neck pour. So give it that. I like the sample I got from Scotch for Dummies more than this. This right now, currently as a neck pour, seems overly woody. There's a little bit too much uh, oak and wood and burnt wood. But I think as I get down a little bit further, I think uh, that'll change. So anyhow, um, looking forward to meeting up with uh, the Whiskey Dick ne next week. Hoping, you know, because our governments, they, we had the government shut down and they got issues with TSA. Hopefully that'll all get resolved. So I won't have any problems with the flights. Uh, the weather should be fine. San Diego is always good. And hopefully the traffic won't be too bad. But looking forward to meeting up with him. Um, I want to meet more and more fellow whiskey tubers, not just as much anime, doing like this. So, I, so I'll spend a couple days in London. So I, I'll leave here July 3rd, land in London July 4th. I'll be there July 4th and July 5th, and I'll go to uh, Scotland on July 6th. So... Um, plan to meet up J Jason Whiskey Wise, but anybody else who's in the area who wants to meet up, that would be a really, really good time to meet up. So I'm hoping to meet up with Alan then. I, I would like to meet Vin. Uh, by the way, Vin is gonna we're gonna, I'm, we're gonna have Vin on next month as as well. Um, and we're gonna kind of do the same thing: record uh, at, uh, on an off hour, and then I'll download, and then re-upload, uh, edit and re-upload. I'll t turn it into a premiere video. Um, but I'd like to meet him as well. So one of the things I want to do more this year is meet more whiskey tubers face to face. I haven't talked to him yet. So if, um, blind whiskey reviews, um, he's in Los Angeles, which is about a five, six hour from, drive from here. Um, and he does about 90% bourbons. So March I'm doing bourbon month. So I'm going to contact him. If he happens to be watching this, uh, I'll, talk, I'll send you an email. Um, Think about drive down to LA, meet up, and then do a. Uh... Master Drum says, "Are you guys going to the Whiskey House in San Diego?" I think so. I think this is what he's got planned. I'm also bringing a bottle down there. I'm bringing a bottle of uh, Lafroy Ten Cast Strength. So we're kind of winging it. Uh, we have to go to. We have to go with whatever um, the schedule works. You know, if if you can't get a good upload. If the time that we're meeting together is the same time that Scotch Ford Dummies is doing their thing, I you know I don't want to try to do a live show while they're doing their thing. Maybe we could go afterwards. I don't know. We do It's not. We don't have a tight schedule. So I'm bringing all my equipment, bringing some whiskeys, and we'll sw we'll we'll wing it. Do do whatever. We will do a video whether it's recorded or live or maybe even both while we're while we're down there. But Bill is one of those guys I've been wanting to meet for a long time. Um, because he's only out in. Massachusetts, near Boston. Um, so if he's here in California, I want to make the effort to meet up. Time for a refill. Um, so which is another reason I want to go down to uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, to meet up with those guys down there. I might do it in October. They're having a big shindig in October. Uh, like in, something like in their annual. So I think that'd be a good opportunity to go down there and meet some um, fo fellow whiskey tribe people. But I'm thinking about doing a Texas whiskey month. Just like I'm doing Isla month. I'm going to do a bourbon month. I'm thinking about doing Texas month. I have one Balcones down here that I've been sitting on for quite some time. So if I can get a direct flight to Austin, I might fly down there over a three-day weekend, visit a couple of distilleries, pick up a couple of bottles, and then do a whole month of, uh, of um, Texas, Texas whiskeys as well. Um, Scott and Bart recently did their top five American whiskeys reviews. If you guys haven't seen that, check that out because they mentioned a number of different um, Texas whiskeys. 
and they talk a little bit about some of the sort of the distinctiveness of Texas whiskeys and the whiskeys that they enjoyed uh, down there that Texas has its own terroir, its own style, its own reflection in whiskeys. And I'm and really, 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 really super uh, curious about that. So if you haven't watched um, Scott's Test Dummies uh, Top 5 American Whiskeys, you definitely want to uh, check that out. I'm going to be back in one second. I'm going to put a couple cubes in this. Talk amongst yourselves. Give me just a second. I'm not doing a quiz. Getting kind of full. I wish I had, I, I'm, not, I'm trying to change my diet, but I could really go for some ice cream after all this. <clears throat> yeah, good time to talk about Eric, as if I wouldn't see it in the chat room when I get back. Quiz. A quiz. Should I do a quiz? Um, Which reminds me, so it's basically done. I wrote a, a Scotch whiskey primer. It's about 60 pages long. Um, I have a couple more books I want to read through before I release it. I'm going to make it available for free. I cover some things in there that a lot of books on Scotch whiskey production don't cover. Um, hey, whiskey friend, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, good, I'll see you on Saturday, Alan. Uh, cheers. Uh, have a good night. I uh, sleep well. Um. <coughs> from from that primer, once I make it available, I'm going to create some more study videos with quizzes in them. In my um, videos for traveling through Scotland, I put some quizzes in some of them. And then I kind of realized it probably wasn't the best time to do that. I should have just been sharing the experience of traveling through Scotland rather than trying to put quizzes in it. But whatever. Um, so I'm going to make some distinctive videos that are just quizzes. And they're meant to complement uh, this uh, Scotch whiskey uh, primer. There was something. Oh, something else I got coming out. So, one of the things in terms of planning uh, trips to Scotland, uh, not all distilleries ha are open to the public. Not all distilleries are open seven days a week. In fact, the only my law school. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. The only distillery that the only distilleries I've noticed that tend to be open on Sundays are the larger ones. I would say all distilleries require booking in advance. So if someone goes up there and just sort of hey, I'm just going to wing it, I'm just going to drive up there or take a plane up there or um, just take a train up there and I'm just going to pop in, it ain't going to happen. You're going to find yourself going to distilleries and it's not going to be open or they're fully booked, or are they required to make reservations? So you don't want to go up there without planning in advance. Otherwise, you're not getting in, in anywhere. In planning a trip, you can spend a lot of time scouring through a map and going through distilleries and, and, and coming up with dead ends because the ones you want to go to aren't open to the public. So as a service to my viewers and fellow whiskey adventurers, I'm going to make uh, available a chart. It'll have every distillery and it'll tell you whether or not it's open to the public. It'll tell you when it's open. Uh, and then the, their schedules change throughout the year. You know, the winter hours, spring hours, summer hours can change a little bit. So there's that issue. Um, and then for the distilleries that I go to, if I have any special insights, uh, recommendations, um, then I'll add that as well. I'm also going to adapt. Uh, it's the SWA's map, which is a, a pretty good map. I'll actually put in there. So the, the map, you know, here, there's the map. And then there's a little, little white circles with the numbers in them. And then off to the side is a list of all the distilleries and broken down to, you know, Highlands, Lowlands, Speyside, Isla, etc. Um, I will add to the map. Not open to public, not open to public, not so. So, you people who want to go there who use this resource, 
uh, won't be spending a lot, won't have to spend as much time trying to plan their trip, be searching a lot of websites and wasting time of looking at places uh, that aren't even open to the public. And of course, that may change from year to year, so it'll have to be you know, uh, reviewed and updated every year. But I think that's a service that could really be uh, useful to a lot of fellow uh, whiskey adventurers. So I'm spending a lot of hours planning my trip. The other thing you need to know is, how okay, you wanna to go to this distillery and this distillery, how far are they apart in time and how do the different tours line up? So if this tour ends at, I'm just making up numbers. If this tour ends at 11 a.m. and you wanna catch the 12 o'clock at this distillery, do you have enough time between this distillery and that distillery to get there or you'd be cutting it too close? It's, th those are the kind of issues. I kind of leave myself a little bit of buffer. I don't like to have to rush, particularly if it's someplace you've never been to, uh, a, a place you're not really familiar with. Something can always go wrong. You get a flat tire, whatever. But I did find that Siri um, and, and, and navigation uh, worked really, really, really well, with the exception of McCollin. Uh, it was trying to direct me to like an old McCollin site. Other than that, it worked uh, pretty, really, uh, pretty, pretty good. So. Um, Jean Paul says, Jean Paul, Jean, Jean Paul, Jan, you say Jean Paul or Jean, Jean Paul, I don't know. Planning trip to Scotland this summer, so thanks for the information. Okay, cool. So I'll be there from July, I mean, Scotland, July 6th through the, I think, the 20th. Um, so I hope to get that all done within a month. Um, now, how do I get it to everybody? I don't have a website at the moment. So I have a, fa I have my own Facebook page. It's Eric Waite Whiskey, Whiskey and Wine Studies on Facebook. On Facebook, you can upload documents. And so there's a files section uh, on my page. And so I upload maps and notes about wine and whatever else there um, on there. So I'll upload it from there and then everybody can download it for free. And then uh, I'll upload a PDF version of my Scotch, uh, Scotch whiskey primer. And then I'll also make a, probably a limited edition of printed copies of my primer that'll autograph and then make available that way uh, as well. But at least people can get it uh, for free. So, and the reason why I'm doing all this, um, I learn by writing, I learn by studying. Um, and because you have to edit and re-edit and edit and re-edit, and so you keep going over your material over and over and over again. That forces that, inf excuse me, that forces that information into your head. So even if, you know, I'm not gonna grade I'm not selling it, whatever else like that. I learn by uh, doing that. Mm. Nice. So what do you guys do? <laughs> I, I, I've been talking and eating and drinking for uh, getting close to an hour here. So, so I'm gonna stop in about five minutes. Then I give me time to sort of change um, clean up here and then uh, tune in for a um, bill over at the Whiskey Dictionary. So what, I don't know if uh, Roy is still in the house. I was real late for him. He's probably gone to bed. Um, what have you guys been drinking? Uh, I'm going back reading over the comments. And enjoying. I hope I'm still on. I hope I'm not talking to myself because now it seems like I'm talking to myself. No, nope, I think I'm still alive. We're still good. Did it freeze? No, nope, no. Nope, okay. When I seen, don't see any chats and they don't know if, any, if anybody's still watching or not. Drinking the, te oh, Teeling. Andrew Spurrell. Thank you very much for uh, joining in. He says, I'm drinking the Teeling single malt. Not very Robbie Burns related though. You know, Teeling, you know, I had a certain um, impression of Ireland was not real thrilled with Ireland. I was like, meh, until I had uh, three Teeling uh, whiskeys uh, uh, for St. Patty's Day, St. Patrick's Day, and it was really, really impressed. So I really, really liked them. Uh, I think Scott and Bart are planning a trip to Ireland, as are uh, Daniel and Rex. I think they're planning to go over there as well. Um, Doug uh, Chrisope is having a Rittenhouse rye. That's also not very uh, Robert Burnish. Anyway, so today is Robert Burns' birthday. 
And that's what we're celebrating. Alrighty, so I think I'm going to call it a night as I finish my last few bites here. Finish this glass. Andrew Dower Caledonia. I've had that before. Very nice. Shall we go out with another round? Jim Beam Single Barrel Select. By the way, if you guys are into bourbons, check out Bourbon Sane. He just did a premiere video. I thought he did a really, really good job. Um, I think he's doing a really, really good job, particularly vi visually, the, you know, the, the lighting and all that. He's doing a really, really good job. Um, so you get, definitely want to uh, check his, his uh, channel out. And he's going to be on with me in March uh, when I do uh, Bourbon Month. So let me see if I'm going to do, I'll do one more. Nah. I, th I was thinking I said, the next couple of lines, I don't even understand what they're talking about. For old Lang Syne. Anyhow, so I want to thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Um, yeah, bourbon month is real. I, only about less than 10% of what I do is bourbon. But I do like bourbons. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know bourbon people. Um, I think I, I've sent invitations to uh, whiskey shenanigans, formerly known as bourbon shenanigans. Um, bourbon Insane, um, My Bourbon Journey. I'm going to send one out to Blind Whiskey Reviews, and but, but see if I can meet up with them uh, uh, as well. Uh, Andrew Spiro says, my local shop did a Robert Burns Whiskey Festival. That's way cool. So where do you live? Last night, I walked away with a Macallan Edition 4. Nice. Uh, and the Spaniard. I'm really curious about the Spaniard and the Tanley Single Malt. Sounds really, really good. Uh, I mean, I like bourbons. I've been to Kentucky. I've been to six distilleries. So I like bourbon. It just isn't my go-to. Uh, I'm just more of a Scotch fan. In fact, I like. I tend to like... I'm more fascinated by Japanese whiskeys than I am by bourbons. Um, Richie Z, on a previous live stream, he'd asked me if I plan to go to Japan. It's on my agenda. Um, I, I, I would have to work out the, the language issues, translation issues. And find out how I'm going to get my way around. Um, at least going to Scotland and England, I could most of the time understand what people were saying. So I don't have that language and cultural uh, barrier. Oh, he's, he's uh, Andrew Sparrow's in Alberta. Um, so it's, I'm a little bit more nervous about going to Japan uh, than I am uh, London or Scotland. Um, and it's a long flight to go to Japan. Um, I know people who are stationed over there uh, when they're in the military. At, and and um, anyway, that's a long flight to get over. But after reading Dave Broom's book, um, The Way of Whiskey on Japanese whiskey, um, and I've been fascinated by Japanese culture, um, art, architecture, um, um, uh, landscape design, uh, and all that. So I, I, I would just love to go to, go to Japan. All right. Hey, I want to thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Hope you guys have an absolutely fantastic uh, weekend. Um, and... Uh, the whiskey deck will be going live in about seven uh, minutes. So uh, thank you much for tuning in. And I'll be live again on Sunday uh, with the Whiskey Church. Uh, Amy, uh, thank you very much uh, for tuning in. All right. Y'all have a good night. And uh, until next time, Slange Yuvat.